Okay, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the 10th Annual Devotee Distinguished Lecture, um, which is also part of our CCI Distinguished Talk Series. Um, we have a great speaker for you today. Uh, we have a quick award presentation, but I also want to say a couple words about uh, Jay Modi, if you haven't read the description. So Jay Modi was a faculty member who joined the Department of Computer Science um, in 2005 after doing a PhD at USC and working at uh, Carnegie Mellon. He worked in the area of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, he was with us just a, a few short years here at Drexel, unfortunately, but uh, he was, even in those short years, named one of the top researchers in AI and also got a uh, National Science Foundation a career award at the time. Um, so we honor his legacy here with this uh, with this event. And as I said, this is his 10th annual event uh, where we've really had some nice um, nice speakers and a nice time up till now. Uh, we're also honored to have uh, Jay's dad, Jay Antimodi, here. He drove in from Harrisburg, as he does every year. So uh, thank you for coming. Okay, and real quick, the, the J. Modi Distinguished Lecture comes with a J. Modi Award, which is awarded to a PhD student in honor of academic excellence and the potential to become a leader in the field. Uh, this year's recipient is Sam Snodgrass, who unfortunately, or actually I guess fortunately, uh, since finishing his PhD, just recently got a job and had to go up to Boston and is now up in Boston at his job and wasn't able to come down here for this presentation. Um, so it's unfortunate they couldn't join us, but it's great that he's up there already working and being the leader in the field that we're awarding him for to begin with. So we'll recognize him remotely. Congratulations, uh, Sam and his advisor, Santiago. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, and we'll have uh, Professor Brian Stewart introduce our speaker. All right. I uh, have the pleasure and honor this morning of uh, introducing our distinguished speaker. If you've ever programmed in C, you no doubt have read or should have read the book affectionately called A and R. If you take our 265 or 571 class, you've studied AWK. The K and K and R and the K and AWK are named after our speaker today. After earning his PhD at Princeton, he joined Bell Laboratories in the computer science research group, becoming a part of what can really only be described as one of the greatest brain trusts of computer science. He worked in the area of programming languages, mathematical programming, typesetting, um, heuristic algorithms for NP problems. Most of us probably know him best from his books, including the C programming language. He's written uh, the elements of programming style, Practice of Programming, and most recently, a book on the Go programming language, and D is for Digital. So, if I went on to describe everything that this man has done, I wouldn't be leaving him any time to talk. So, I'm going to stop now and ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Fernandez. Thank you, Brian. Excessively kind introduction, and thank you all for coming at this point. Um, so, what I'm going to do today, assuming this works, and you notice that the microphone is not properly attached, it's got one of those flexi clips. Uh, it's because somebody liberated a piece of equipment from the podiums here. Um, so, if you can hear me in the back row, move forward, and if I move too far forward, I'll kill you with the feedback. Um, so, anyway, let's see what happens as uh, we progress here. Um, so, this is kind of we get the feedback, so or maybe it's too bad. Um, this is an odd combination of uh, computer science and digital humanities. I'm guessing that most people here have a pretty clear idea what computer science is in some way or another. Probably fewer of you have an idea of what digital humanities is, and that's certainly true of me. Uh, it was true of me not too long ago. Um, so what is digital humanities? Um, when you need to know the facts about something, you go to Wikipedia, of course, because Wikipedia is the source of all truth. And, it says it's uh, a very strong activity at the intersection of computing and the disciplines of the humanities. Okay, so that's actually a useful definition, but um, what does that really mean? To me, I think digital humanities means doing with interesting data from a different area, the same kinds of things that we do 
many kinds of data. We try to collect it, clean it up. We try to um, analyze it in some way, present it so that other people can actually understand what it means, and hopefully gain some benefit from doing it. And the only real issue here is the data in digital humanities comes from things that are the traditional humanities disciplines like English, uh, history, art, religion, music, things of that sort. So what is a computer scientist like me doing with something like this? Because I assure you, I have no training, no particular expertise, but through a, what we called a sequence of accidents a few years ago, um, I found myself as acting director of the newly formed Princeton University Center for Digital Humanities because the real director, the person who knew it all, my colleague Meredith Martin from the English department, uh, was on maternity leave. Um, I also volunteered quite foolishly to give a independent work seminar for computer science juniors and seniors and majors in computer science who might be interested in digital humanities. So I had these two things going on. Um, and uh, that was the problem. So I got into it. The bottom line is that this actually turned out to be a lot of fun. I had a good time doing it. I made some new friends, uh, discovered some interesting things about a variety of areas both computing and non computing. And so that's what I want to talk about uh, today, trying to give you a kind of a reprise of that and the various aspects, both personally and how it showed up in my class. So, digital humanities has been a field for, call it 25-ish years or something like that. One of the very earliest projects was this thing called the Valley of the Shadow, which was done at the University of Virginia. Um, what they did was to collect an enormous amount of information about the Civil War, which of course was going on in the Shenandoah Valley. They collected things that were specific fundamentally to two towns, a southern town and a northern town. Um, and it was things like newspaper stories and um, books and letters and people's photographs and reminiscences and military journals and all kinds of things. They just collected a huge amount of information, converted it to the digital form, and made it available on the web so that anybody could look at it for interest and perhaps for the research. And it was presented in this way, sort of, you're in a library, if you like, with three big rooms or big areas with smaller rooms. The left one is the period in the run-up to the war, and the middle part is the war itself, and then the third part is reconstruction, at least the early years of reconstruction. So this is a very, very nice project, one of the first in the area. And as you can see, it's basically history. Uh, here's another one which I find interesting. This was done at Stanford. It's a network model of the Roman world. So I suspect most of you at some time or another have used something like Kayak or Expedia or whatever to figure out what's the best way to get from here to there, how long is it going to take, how much is it going to cost, and so on. This is Kayak for Rome, around 50 AD or something like that. So you want to know how long will it take you to get from Roma to Montenegro, how much is it going to cost, what are the possible routes? And so what this will do is to say, well, there's a, obviously an overland route there, there's a sort of some boat, some overland, coast hugging, and then there's one that goes across the Mediterranean or that. And in fact, it provides extra information so that you can estimate the cost of these things, like how much wheat do you have to feed your donkey so you can ride instead of walk? How much is that going to cost in Denary? It's a really, really fascinating site if you're interested in as I am, the answer of Roman history kinds of things. So, well worth seeing. Um, another one, speaking of Londinium, uh, that's much more modern, is this site that was put together 10 or 15 years ago or something like that. Old Bailey is the central, or was for a long time, the central criminal court in London. So, if you did something bad in the London area, you wound up at the Old Bailey. And in fact, they kept extremely accurate records of this, complete transcripts of court cases, what happened, who accused who of what, what the punishments were, and so on. And they did that from when this opened in 1674 until it finally shut down in 1913. And so they had a collection of real transcriptions of trials of ordinary people. This was not kings getting their heads chopped off. This was just ordinary people. They told me this. Um, 200,000 of these ordinary people uh, court cases. And it's an absolutely fascinating site to, to visit. One of the things you can do is to find somebody whose name you know and see if you can find out anything about 
their ancestors. Well, I worked fairly hard, and I can't find anybody in this room who I knew really well whose name would probably fit, but I did find at least one person who was a Philadelphia connection. Uh, <laughs> Back in 1790, a famous actress and a famous local printer um, were caught uh, stealing a pig valued five shillings from a gentleman named Thomas Powell. Okay? And so, this is the case, and it goes on like this for a while. And as it turned out, they decided that Ms. Taylor was not guilty. But Mr. Franklin was guilty. You know, the timing is about right. There's that February 1790. He died in April 1790. No longer when he was actually in. Um, so there you have it. And he was sentenced to be whipped. Okay, purple punishment whipping, which doesn't sound like fun. Although I'm told it's a good way to motivate undergraduates. Is that <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, the intriguing thing about these punishments, by the way, if this had happened a hundred years earlier. Franklin would have been hanged, period. No one would do it once more. If this had happened 50 years earlier, it's pretty likely that Franklin would have been transported. Now, I think many of you have a picture of what transportation is. You put people who committed a crime in England, and you put them on a boat, and you send them to Australia, right? This is a picture of, of transportation. Not quite. They were sent to the colonies. What was the closest colony? We're here. <laughs> So all of those criminals in London who were, who were transported were transported to places like Philadelphia. And that, I am sure, explains all kinds of things about the local <laughs> Anyway, um, this is what the stuff looked like originally. You can see it's kind of dirty. Um, this is actually good compared to what you would see in the 1690 time period. They had to take all that stuff and basically keyboard it so that you had the data, but they also had to figure out the tagging so that they could see that Elizabeth Taylor and Benjamin Franklin were the perps, uh, the column was a witness, and further down, things like the punishments and so on, because they're all just written in this relatively stereotype, but still hard to process. So these were keyboarded in some places like India at considerable expense, and also tagged with the various things like victim, perp, and so on. Okay? Let's go a little forward in time and move slightly north, or actually more to the met geography. So there's a woman named Sylvia Beach who was actually born in Baltimore. Didn't know that until I looked it up yesterday on Wikipedia, this is her uh, But Sylvia Beach was born in Baltimore and then moved to Princeton for a while because her father was minister of one of the churches in um, Princeton. And then just after the First World War, she moved to Paris and she established a bookstore called Shakespeare and Company. You just swore to see it across the top on the right there. So she established this bookstore, which ran from 1919 and sort of trickled off in 1941 when the Germans took over Paris. Uh, but in that time, that bookstore became a magnet for an enormous number of people who were what would be called the literary part of the lost generation. Famous authors, primarily, who were English or Irish or American writing in English. Relatively less interest from the local French authors, but tremendous interest from well-known names in the um, English literary world. So the guy on the left with Sylvia Beach is Ernest Hemingway. The guy on the right, meaning what king, is James Joyce. James Joyce is the author of Ulysses. Sylvia Beach published Ulysses in 1922 because, well, we also published it because it was part of profit. Um, but she published it and therefore helped to establish Joyce's career in that sense. So this is Shakespeare and Company. It's a bookstore and a lending library. It's kind of what you would have seen with something like Barnes and Noble or whatever uh, today, where people would gather to copy or whatever. They would take books away and they would buy them and so on. And the interesting thing is, long after um, Sylvia Beach died, she buried in Princeton, in fact, um, but somehow her papers found their way to Princeton University's library, and they became an object of study, digital humanities. This is a part of Ernest Hemingway's library card at Shakespeare and Company. It was kind of interesting, and you can see some of the issues related to digital humanities. Notice there's several different addresses there. There are dates in all kinds of weird formats that some big letters across the top is, this is Hemingway's card as opposed to somebody else. 
and just contributing things. And this one kind of bemuses me. Somewhere along there, he bought a copy of his own book. <laughs> <laughs> one way to get your Amazon ranking up like that. <laughs> but it's only possible to accept the English news. Um, there are over 500 of these library cards, and so there's an ongoing project run by a colleague of mine in the English department saying, what? What went on here? Who talked to who? When did they do it? What were they looking at? What were the various influences on these people who were creating quite a bit of a very important literature at the time? So this is a nice example of a specific instance of digital humanities, but also shows you some of the generic problems that you have to work with if you're in this field. Yeah, you have to get the data and digitize it, because almost none of this data was born digital. It's often very, very uh, ugly to work with. It might be printed, as you saw, like that in the 1700s and hard to read, or it might be handwritten like the Hemingway card that we had there, which is very hard to read. So you have to digitize it. You have to tag it, figure out, well, this is an address, this is a date, this is currency, or whatever. This is a perpetrator, this is a witness. All of those things have to be done you have to figure out what that is, and then, of course, you have to do all the other things that you can then do once you've got data, which is you can put it up and start to think about it, what you've got is to present it in a way that other people might profit from it as well. So, here I am, I am acting, and the operative word is acting, I was pretending because I had no idea what digital communities was, um, the acting director of the Center for Digital Communities. I lined up to teach a course, this is the summer before I teach the course, and I'm thinking, ah. and then I got, Forced into giving a talk at a conference on social networking. I don't know anything about social networking. I have never had, nor will I ever have, a Facebook account, for example. Uh, so I don't know anything about that stuff. Um, I was stuck. And then, by accident, I stumbled into a, an example, a really interesting and almost personally engaging uh, example of an early social network. And I was able to use that as doing my own exploration about this field that I know nothing, nothing about teach the course, and have this, this much more credibility with my colleagues in uh, humanities when I talk about digital humanities. Okay, so, there are two women, obviously different periods of time, um, who happen to be in the same social network. It's kind of interesting and totally unobvious what that social network might be. Well, I stumbled into this social network and the potential relationship between these two women um, when I was Googling around. All of you have heard of uh, Google Books, right? Google Books. Google has been scanning them since probably 2004. Books and books and books, scanning them. They've got 25 minutes to scan, I'm told. Um, and they give you both the PDF of the page and they also give you the OCR of it so that you have a chance to process the text. I was Googling around for something, and I came across an interesting line in this book. This is a book called The Descendants of Nicholas Cady of Watertown, Mass, 1645 to 1910. Um, this is scanned from a copy printed in 1910 that is in the Boston Public Library. Uh, it, of course, I think has a very, very limited print run. But basically, Nicholas Cady came from England in 1645, landed at Watertown. Um, at age of probably 20, 25, something like that. And his descendants over time had at least some influence on the United States, mostly in that corner of um, New England, but they spread across the country as well. And in 1910, Warren Pierre Allen, who was one of these descendants, 10 or 11 generations down, uh, decided to collect all this information and write it in a book. Now, genealogy, I am not a genealogy type, but you probably know people who are genealogy types, and they love this stuff and really enjoy it. Um, it's kind of interesting. I think the reason for this particular genre of a book is something that we might call Mayflower Envy. In this country, and I'm not part of this, I know things I'm not this. Um, if your ancestors came to the United States on the Mayflower in 1620, you were deemed to be a superior social being. Okay? And if your ancestors came not too long after that, then you're still pretty superior social being. And so there was a state of these books in the early 1900s that basically took a family that arrived in New England relatively early, like mid 1600s, and followed them down to the early 1900s 
uh, the Tenney family, the Howard genealogy. I had not heard of these. I was talking to a friend of mine named Howard Tricky, and he said, oh yeah, there's one about the Howards, that's why I'm called Howard. There you are. Uh, so these things are pretty true. Okay. So what's the relationship? Let's look at the tiny part of the tree of children of Nicholas Cage. So at the top we have Nicholas, first generation, 1620 to 1700, roughly. He had a bunch of children, a modest number of children, one of whom was James, so we'll call it James level two. Um, and James had a bunch of children, one of them was John level three, and John had children, including Ebenezer level four, okay? And at that point, there's more to the tree, but I'm just focusing on this. And off on the left side, we have Elisha 5, and Asa 6, and Eliza and 7. And in, this is something that wouldn't work today, but in those days, if you were a woman in the Canaan line, and you married somebody, you lost your position in the line. You were there, but none of your children were part of the group anymore. Okay, They might still show up, but they didn't count because you lost your, your name. So anyway, we have going past the rise of man, we have Timothy Sandra Brown, Sarah Brown Colley, and the name that I discovered, Robert Colley, born in 1893. And this is a name that's actually sort of familiar to me, for reason to see. On the other side, we have Eliezer 5, and Daniel 6. And now, let's fill in just one more level of the tree. On this side, we have a woman named Margaret Colley, who's my wife. Okay. And on the other side of the tree, we have an extremely important woman, Elizabeth Gates Hammond, who was one of the intellectual powerhouses behind women's rights in the late 1800s in the United States. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, so it's kind of interesting that there is this relationship that you, my wife is the aunt's cousin in k Town's room or something like that from Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And this is absolutely correct information, no question about it whatsoever. For example, Robert Colley, my father-in-law, uh, had a brother named Stanton. They're, just, they're all born and lived in that same part of the state of New York. So no question about that at all. Um, for those of you who don't know, you should. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was really very important in this. There were two women, I think, in the late 1800s who were particularly important in issues of women's rights. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we have mentioned, and the other one is uh, Susan B. Anthony, who you may remember from the award of two or one dollar coin that was issued with her face on it some 20, 30 years ago, or something like that. So, Anyway, this is kind of interesting to me. I think it's less interesting to my wife, although the last time we were in the area, we actually went to the Women's Rights National Park in Seneca Falls. I recommend it. Um, all right, so let's go back to the book. The physical book looks like this. This is a modern printing. This was printed in 1990, and I found it on someplace, you know, Amazon News Books or something like that. Uh, the original was gone. But, you know, it's a fat book. It's kind of hard to read, but it's okay. The average page in it sort of looks like this. This is half of the page in the book. And you can see that scanning that is not too bad. You should have a readable pen. You notice down here the children are numbered one through seven and are the liberals. Uh, this is John Forkey, who was son of Sergeant John Frigidson. Uh, so there are four children, three of whom show up later in the book. So this is cross over to cloud of information. The trouble is that's PDF, WLCR, so you can kind of provide it. You can see, it's hard, you can read it, but a lot of information is lost. And in particular, the fact that this guy had seven children, and some of them are further length, does not show up in this data at all. Okay. So it's kind of a nuisance to go on that. But my project is to say, let's see if I can actually get something with it. Can I extract information from this book and actually do something useful or interesting with it? So I'm doing just what I said earlier that people would have to do with things like the Old Bailey or the um, library cards and Shakespeare and computers. I have to collect the data, clean it up, and figure out the metadata to add to it. You know, this is Nicholas One, he's level one, and he has children named whatever. That's level two, I can get that kind of metadata to set up to figure out well, how to store it, and then all the other things that you want to do to take this hard work that I was proposing to do and convert it into something so that other people would profit from it. So this is the basic observation. How do you do that? Well, the obvious thing is 
digital humanities, although it's relatively different fields, has been around for a while and people have built tools, and so you should, in principle, be able to say, oh, okay, so I have this new thing, I'll just plug it into some of the existing tools. And then everything will become pure. Okay. What are some of the tools? There are tools that will do various kinds of textual analysis, uh, do some machine learning or classification kinds of things for you. Uh, Digital humanoids, sorry, humanists are particularly interested in various kinds of network visualizations. Who was connected to who over what periods of time? So they're very interested in that kind of thing. And so, lots of So that's the kind of what have people done already in this gap. And then underneath it is the sort of, well, what tools would, do we have that if we didn't like what somebody had done before us, we could do more ourselves? And so there's D3 for graphics. You want to do graphical things on Web pages, D3 is hard to beat. Um, mapping things, I suspect most of you have played with NLTK at one point or another. Uh, so I can learn that there's a really nice collection of Python packages for doing machine learning. And of course, R is kind of the standard for statistics and visualization in many communities. Okay, so those are some of the things you have to work with. What could you do with them? Well, one thing you can do, and you get this for free from what is, is a word cloud. I don't know about you, but I found word clouds pretty but useless. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is nice, I saw it. Uh, but it is not a surprise to discover that people in New England in the 1700s and 1800s had children named George, Charles, James, John, Mary, you know, it's just huh, absolutely standard kinds of thing. So this is nice but useless, roughly speaking. Um, how about seeing the ancestor tree? I gave a very small part of the tree that went from Nicholas down to my wife on one side and this is Katie and Stanton on the other side. I uh, couldn't do the tree. Well, this didn't work very well. I mean, you can see Nicholas had, assuming I got them all, there were six kids, and maybe there's some that fell off the left hand, and then just picking one, Captain Joseph, he had. And so, so it's very, very hard to visualize this because, as you can imagine, the tree that branches, this is an algorithmic question, you guys should know all about this, right? If the tree is here and it branches five times on each level, you've been at 10 levels, you have a lot of people there. It's not going to fit up on the screen. Okay, so exponential process or something like that, is that bad? Forget. Uh, you guys are going to think of your computer science. So maybe you could do something else. Other people visualize trees. This is kind of a weird one. Uh, Pretty but useless, in a sense. This is something called Cytoscape, which I think originally was meant for doing genomics data. And it's been repurposed for doing kind of genealogical uh, data or this kind of networking thing, and I think that's useless as well, unfortunately. So I actually don't know how to visualize this, other than in some kind of interactive form where you can zoom in and hope at things that you're interested in, and I haven't done that part yet. Okay. But could you do something more useful or interesting that wasn't just plugging in existing standardized tools? So here's a thought. Let's look more carefully at this data. This is John Poor, etc. And you notice here, he had a son who was born in 1734 and died so soon afterwards that they didn't name him. Okay. And then down here in 1739 40, uh, he had a son named John who was born and died on the same day. This is sort of suggestive of the fact that there was a lot of infant mortality in those days. Quite a bit. Is there some way that you could use the data in a book like this to characterize infant mortality? Could you actually do something by processing the text, extracting born on, died on, and just swapping something from that? Well, it turns out you can. And this is a graph of about 1900 people where I was able to sort of rebut, semi reliably extract the uh, when was he or she born, when did they die. Um, and as you can see, infant mortality was a grave issue there. There was about 400 kids who died before they got age five. Okay. So that's about 20% of the population didn't get that. If you live that long, then you know, you're going to have a store of a plausible chance at the extent of life. A modern day curve, by the way, looks, there's a little tiny, tiny rise in infant mortality at age 0 to 1, and then the curve is basically dead flat until you get into the year 50s and 60s when it starts to rise, which is completely nervous. But, this, but that infant mortality part is something that is kind of scary and unusual, at least in modern times. Okay? 
There's something else that's interesting. Here we have Willard's Holden Cave, level seven, but much more recent. So, and he had three wives. Okay. So he was married, then he was married again, he was married a third time. Um, in the second marriage, she had two children named Emma. Odd. But the reason is that Emma the first here lived only four years. Okay? And so Emma the second was born a year or so after the death of her older sister named Emma. And then Willard had a third marriage and he gave one of his children, Emma, there as well. Now this I find unusual. We live in a time when fortunately mortality is very low. God said a child would live past their first year very high. Um, and so the idea of reusing a name like this, it sort of seems weird to me. I don't know where it went to you, but it seems unusual or strange to me. But it was very common, and in fact it's something you can extract from this database, that there were a lot of cases, maybe five percent of families or something, where the names were reused. And a handful of triples like this. So that's kind of an interesting and uh, in a way different kind of cultural thing. Okay, so where do we go from here? So I'm sitting there thinking, could we do more with this data? This is very simple stuff. Um, there's a lot of data that you could imagine. It's sort of in the same spirit as when we uh, people born and died with longevity, when did people get married? Did they get married young? Is perhaps the impression is, or did they actually put off marriage longer than you think? Uh, was that different between men and women? So there's the data there that you could do too. And there are even social issues. Willard came there in the previous slide had three wives. This was not because Willard Katie divorced his wives. This is because his wives died. So people died. Remember, when that curve of mortality was sort of flat ish. Today, Willard had three wives. The reason would be he divorced the first two. In this document, in that whole book, the word divorce does not appear until the late 1800s. It was a completely different social environment, and we discovered that earlier in the book. So that's kind of intriguing in a way as well. But anyway, there's things that you can do, lots of weird uh, things that I have played with casually, some of which I'd love to play with more seriously, but I haven't gotten to it. Uh, but I wanted to talk about one uh, because I don't do machine learning. I should be taking a machine learning course. You all should. Because if you can say machine learning, you can get a job. Right? <laughs> so uh, I don't know machine learning, but I decided to try an experiment. So there are about Almost 800 given names, like John and Mary, in this book. There's actually an index at the back of given names, and some of those names are very strange. So there are two people named, or is it one person, named Barzilla and Brazilla. And I do not know, I have no clue whether this is two people, one of whom is a typo, or, or no, two distinct people, or one person and a typo. I, I just don't know. Uh, the thing that it reminded me of, in fact, was. <laughs> Or you know, one of these. But the real question is, what's the gender of Barzilla or Brazil? I'm, I'm not sure gender, gender were showed up in the discussions of uh, either Godzilla or Godzilla. But um, for Brazil, it's actually an issue. Um, and in fact, there's lots of questions. Can you tell in any way the gender of somebody from the name? So it's a tiny machine learning thing. Here's, here's the names, by the way. We can do an audience poll, we won't. Uh, but you know, who knows what the gender is from the name? Um, so anyway, uh, I just said I learned some time better machine learning by doing an experiment. Uh, there is a rule that works pretty well for this kind of population, and probably not for a more diverse population these days. But it says that if a name ends in A, it's a decent chance it's a female name. Obviously it doesn't work for names like Joshua, or the Jose Maria, the one of the Spanish names, but well, and so I just basically did some experiments, and it turns out it actually works sort of decently well. It's a kind of seventy-eight percent predictor, so it's better than chance, but not the only thing. So, okay, uh, you can also do things like mapping. There's a lot of geographic information. The family started in wherever it was in Massachusetts, and gradually people 
propagation across the whole country, so you can see this, and, and by that technology, it shows you that in other places that you can see in Chrome. Um, all those things are kind of interesting. When you try to do this stuff, you learn lessons. So part of the goal of education is person in front has made a bunch of mistakes, tries to tell students, hey, don't make these mistakes, go and make your own new mistakes. You learn more from it. Um, doesn't always work, does it? <laughs> you make the same old mistakes. But anyway, uh, some of the mistakes that I made, and I think it's really true, and especially true in digital humanities, you can spend all of your time trying to clean up your data. It's like removing cat hair from a rug. Okay? You just can't get it all right, no matter what you do. Keep going. Um, the other thing is, don't have grand plans because you won't make them work. Have small things you can try one at a time. So my grand plan is, you know, put the whole book on a web page that was interactive with links and pop-ups and then it's impossible. Hard enough to just parse it and get those things done. So a lot of things of that sort that are interesting. So that was the high point, but then the question is, can I convey some of that to the students and put them in an environment where they have to do something analogous? I don't care what it is that they work with, but they have to find some interesting data and go off and do some in that vaguely analogous uh, sort of analysis. Let me look at, let's, let's look at some of the examples. So I mentioned the, um, Shakespeare and Company and lending cards and so on. And so one project a couple of years ago was to say, okay, just where did these people live? Let's just see if we can put them on a map of Paris so that we can see where they are. So this is the sand that goes this way. So this is the left bank. And you notice everybody lives on the left bank. You're the left bank, that's it. Um, and where do they live? Well, uh, Sylvia Beach, the Shakespeare and Company is right there. Where it is. And now here's a huge sign. But it's Hemingway, you know, over there, it's the in the bar, so you can see sort of where people are uh, in Paris, and I can't remember when Maya made that dynamic, in some sense or not, I just walked with it, because that was like 20 years ago at this point. Um, totally different kind of map. I think it's popular because it's a great way to visualize things that relate to geography. Anything that has a sort of where are we in the world component is good. Um, this was a really, really fine project by Sun Wang Cheng. There is a classic of Chinese literature called the Great Tang Records, during the West, on the Western regions or whatever. Um, a Buddhist monk, I apologize for my Chinese, John Zhang, made a trip in roughly 600 AD from China to all these places in the sort of Western side of you know, Tibet and India and so on. And for each place he went, he wrote down the name of the kingdom, the approximate size of you know, the nature of the people there, the kind of crops they had, what was the weather like, and so on. He did this in a fairly formulaic way. Um, and so what Sun Wan did was basically say, okay, let's take that data, this really interesting historical document, and see if we can convert it into modern form so that we can lay on a modern map where he went and what he discovered as he did it. And so this required Processing, of course, the English translation of this, but he also did translations in Chinese, both traditional Chinese, because he found a Buddhist university in Taiwan that was actually had some of the data. Now, one semester for a junior, not too bad. Um, something closer to home. There's a lot of data from census and other things that indicate people's religious affiliations. And so Justin's project here was to simply at the county level plot these things and make that interactive so that you could pick whatever flavor or religious denomination you wanted to investigate, but also a timeline so it was inspired to see how this changed over a period of time. A nice, interesting demonstration. Uh, those are mapping. Natural language processing is another area that students found very interesting. In Princeton, there is a student newspaper, kind of like what's in the tribal here or something. Uh, yeah, um, called the Daily Princetonian, or it's not daily. Um, and it has been published since 1876 or something like that, but uh, it's been very carefully digitized so you can actually process it. There's also in the town a throwaway newspaper, one of these dropping on your driveway kind of newspapers called Town Topics. That's been digitized since 1946. So then the question is here you have these two things parallel, town and gown, or the other way around. Uh, Things that are news events going forward for you know, 70 years or something like that. Can you see anything interesting, for example, in the use of language? So, just one specific thing that no one observed 
is the frequency of the word oriental. So oriental for a long time was the way that was what people um, mean in terms of it. And then at some point that was became a pejorative term. And so that fell off to almost zero usage in the Daily Princetonian around the 1870s. But it stayed in effect even more high in the town topics until it fell off in the early 2000s. Is this that the town is slow to recognize a potential racial slur? Or is it the fact that there is a oriental rug story? I don't know. But it's interesting. Just how do you look at data and try and extract something from it? Um, back to China and literary texts. Uh, this is way outside my expertise. Yes. But this is uh, basically co location. The words occur together in a particular set of literary Chinese documents. These are short stories from the time of Song Dynasty long ago. Um, and you know, what are the words, how do they come together? And of course, figuring out what's a word in Chinese is challenging. And in particular, literary or you know, traditional Chinese, that is something that's say before 1900 ish, is different from modern Chinese. And so uh, Roland did a lot of work to kind of do that sort of thing. And then one last example, just for fun. Um, this is a classic machine learning. You know, this is how much is a house going to cost? Except this is a different kind of market. How much is a piece of art? So Pablo decided quite early, early September, that he was going to explore this question. Could you predict the price of a piece of art that showed up at auction? And the timing was good. This painting of Saul Leonardo, Salvador for Hundi, was uh, auctioned in the middle of November for $450 million. <laughs> so it's slightly more than pocket change. Uh, could you do something to predict that sort of thing? And so what Pablo did was to try and put characteristics that might go into a model of art prices so that you could make a prediction model of it. And um, that would be things like the artist. Leonardo is obviously important. Uh, the relative abundance or scarcity of their works. There aren't very many Leonardo's, especially paintings. Um, so things like that, perhaps actual history of those. But then also just, suppose you took images and just threw them into uh, a classic, a, a thing that generated feature vectors. And IBM provides a service where you give it an image and it'll give you back a $4,000 feature vector without any idea what the features are. This is a machine learning at its best. There's some numbers. Uh, and so, combining all of those things, he produced a uh, model for this stuff. And here's an example of it. the picture by Monet. Um, a group of the therapists and you know, all big. Okay, that's kind of a nice picture. Monet is a very good target for this kind of thing because there's a lot of Monet's around. He painted a lot of things and they have, I wouldn't say similarities, but they're, you know, there's a recognizable style and so on. And so you should be able to do something. Uh, with this. And so, what uh, Pablo did in this one is Sotheby's before the auction said the range is going to be $5.9 to $7.9 million. That's our guess of what this will go for. Uh, and Pablo's model, ex post facto, but uh, it was $7.7 to $10.9, and the actual selling price a decade ago was $8.4. So he's more accurate than Sotheby's, right? Not bad for undergraduate. Well, it turns out one of the other things that came out of his study, not surprisingly perhaps, is the observation that auction houses systematically skew their estimates low. Right? And it's crystal clear from their data. Their estimates are always low. They're lowballing because that way potential buyers will think, well, I have a chance, and potential sellers will, will be pleased when it sells for more than that. So you can see the curve as it skewed off in that direction. Um, so, interesting kind of observation. So, you can see there's a lot of different things here, and, you know, and there were, in two years, two dozen things like this. Some of them completely off the wall, others pretty conventional, all of them intriguing at one way or another. So, my hope is that the students who went through this, and if there was a you hope this kind of stuff for all education, uh, that you learn some practical things. Like data is just fun. There's no such thing as data. You should, right? Guarantee. Um, in the humanities, tagging is really tough. You have to figure out ahead of time what are the important things that you want to keep a record of it because it costs you a lot of to get those uh, items in a form that you can process. Yeah. And so on. So there's lots and lots of things that are tough. 
And there are trade-offs that you have to make if you spend too much time on preparing the data, then you never get a chance to actually analyze it. Um, you can't do things by hand. It takes too long. But there's some things you can't do by hand. So uh, lots and lots of some concrete lessons that I think they should learn. I think there's also a bunch of what I would call um, more philosophical lessons that I would love to have them learn. Uh, one is that exploring a new area is just fun. It's really a lot of fun to go and try something different, something that hasn't been mined out. Uh, and it's fun <laughs> intrinsically, but it's also, I think, rewarding to work with people who are different, who come at things from a different perspective. And so you work with people, in this case, in the humanities, and that feels really kind of neat. So I guess the bottom line of that is that computer science obviously has things to offer the humanities and anything else because we know how to manipulate data, how to extract information from the machine learning model. We know all that kind of stuff. Um, and so the data that people in the humanities have is a net to that. So we're useful to them. But I think the flip side is that they've got lots and lots and lots of things that they can offer us that I think are really, really worth having. Um, they have neat data. You can tell a lot of this stuff is intrinsically very interesting. They have neat new problems that you might want to work on. They're kind of fun. Um, they bring new perspectives to what you're doing, so you get a better idea of what might be interesting and relevant and important. Um, and you make new friends that way. So I think in that sense, it's a really good deal. So I encourage thinking that way. Anyway, that is all I wanted to say. Uh, so thanks to some absolutely great students and some of my colleagues in various parts of the university who helped make this stuff go. Anyway, that is all. Thank you very much for coming.